Welcome to the Grace of Eugene podcast. We exist to help every person in our sphere of influence to encounter Christ, experience biblical community, and extend God's kingdom. You can learn more about us at gracecityeugene.com. Here's the podcast. Well, we are in week eight of our Core Strength series. Second to last week, we're like starting at verse 2 in the fourth and last chapter of Colossians. And uh, it's only four chapters, but man, it's been full, hasn't it? A lot of good stuff, a lot of uh, conviction for me. I pray that there's been some healthy conviction that leads you uh, to Jesus through this as well. Um, And today we're going to talk about this idea of a gospel rhythm, a gospel rhythm. Um, I was thinking like, man, what, what are some other areas of my life that I've had to experience taking in all different inputs of information, some of it very new, some of it new context and new disciplines and things that helped create a rhythm in my life for success in something. And one that I, that I was thinking of, um, some of you may know this, some of you may not, like a long time ago I was an athlete, <laughs> that was many years ago, um, but when I showed up to play college football, coming from a very small town of like 1,800 people and going to a university and showing up for football, it was, it was a huge shock to my system. There was a lot of things that I had no clue, even like the, the verbiage they were using to explain things that I thought I'd done my whole life was all completely new. And going to a school with thousands of people rather than dozens of people was a big change for me. And obviously, you're in high school, and it's like there's a few good players on a team, and you go to college, and it's like, well, everybody was a good high school player. To be here, there was just a lot of change. And for the first couple weeks, I'll be honest, I was just like, my, my head was just, I felt like a bobblehead. I was, I was like, what's going on? Where do I go? What, what am I supposed to do? I don't understand what's happening. I had to learn a new language of sorts, this language of football within the systems that I was now playing in, the type of offense, defense, team chemistry, team culture, the relationships, the dynamics of leadership between head coach, position coaches, like team leaders and captains, and myself as this lowly freshman and, you know, the new guy on the block. And I had to learn new skills, new plays, how to discern calls that would come in on a wristband to know what play I'm supposed to run. There was so much. And so for the first two weeks, it was kind of disorienting as I was just collecting all the information about what it would look like to be able to do my job, my role, and actually flourish as a football player on this team. But what I realized is all of that work and learning a new language, leadership structure, culture, relationships, all of these things actually helped me to have a rhythm in the team. So then when it came time that I actually needed to walk out my role and do my responsibility, it just came as second nature. It just became second nature. And I wonder if, if we were to think about our lives, if there are areas like that where maybe you started something out And it was disorienting. There was so much to learn. Maybe it was the first full-time job you had. Maybe it was your first, like, professional type of job outside of college. Maybe it was your first term of university. Whatever it may be, where you started out and you just felt kind of lost. And you had to spend a couple weeks orienting yourself, learning what you were a part of, so you could walk out in a rhythm to fulfill your job, your purpose, and understand just kind of the culture that you were existing within. And that is a little bit of what's been happening here as Paul's explaining to the church in Colossae, like there's a new culture, there's new standards, there's standards of purity, there's standards of what you will take in as teaching and to be truth. You have to run it through the playbook, which was their scriptures, right? Does that match up with the way that God tells us to live? Like there's a leadership structure as Paul is like, hey, I'm kind of the apostle of this church. I'm encouraging you. I'm leading you. You have local leaders. We read later in Philemon that he's kind of a leader of this. There's all of these things they're navigating. And now as Paul is bringing this letter to a close, he's saying, now, students, it's time to live this out as a rhythm. You have taken in this information. I have shared with you the heart that I've been trying to convey. But now this isn't about you intaking information and just learning anymore. It's about you walking this out. Living your life in a healthy gospel rhythm where just things are moving together. They're clicking, if you will. All the gears are lined up and the wheels are turning at a pace and a tempo that is in stride with Jesus and the work that he is doing. 
And I believe that as we enter into today, we need to think about how do we walk out a healthy gospel rhythm today in your life, wherever you are and wherever God has planted you. So in this brief passage, Paul helps us see what it looks like to live in rhythm. Not just like a ping pong ball all over the place, like ah, ah, reacting to everything, but like in a rhythm. Loving God in prayer and loving our neighbors in the way we speak and live. That is just the quick summary of this passage. So I'm going to read it and we're going to dig in and see what this means for us and how we can walk it out. Sound good? Colossians 4 verses 2 through 6. It's a long one, so buckle up. We got five verses here. It says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, this is Paul speaking, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is meaningful and applicable to us here today. Holy Spirit, I pray for open hearts, open minds to receive your truth and then to apply it in our lives so that we can, in your name, impact the world that we live in. So we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So we're nearing the end of the letter here, obviously. And Paul takes his instruction from how the Christian community was to behave towards God and towards others, the gospel-shared rhythm of their lives. Like, okay, here's someone, let's get your heart right, and now here's how you interact with God and each other. This passage gives us a clear indication that the apostle wants the Colossians to arrange their lives with Jesus Christ at the center, at the core. And this really starts to take into account that he wants them to do it for the sake of the world around them that is watching. We would call it for our testimony, for what, how we are testifying with our lives to the person of Jesus and his work in our lives. So this isn't just about, hey, what's, what's going on in your heart? How do we work on your heart? Now it moves it to, hey, this is about how we live, and that's for the sake also of those that are watching. He refers to them as outsiders. What he means is those who are not following the way of Jesus. It's not like some exclusive, like, oh, you're an outsider, you're not in the club. No, it's just like those that are not walking out the way of Jesus. Like, it matters when they look at you that they see a life lived after me. And the first four words of verse 2 immediately challenge us. Like, we could stop right after this and just do an entire sermon. It says, continue steadfastly in prayer. If, if, like, deep down inside of you, you're not like, oh, that's good, I got an application point already. Well, then you're the most holy person in the room and, like, teach me. <laughs> because that, no matter, like, who you are, that is, that is hard, right? Continue steadfastly in prayer. It's a sermon all of its own because we live in this world of instant gratification and trying to get faster download speeds, trying to get better cell service, whatever it is, more efficient ways to accomplish what we want. And continuing steadfastly in things is not normal. In our society, to continue to faithfully walk out, to be steadfast in, like, not just a minute, but in a month, right? To continue to walk something out. We talked about forbearance a couple weeks ago. To, like, continue to walk with people and in things even when it's uncomfortable. Like, that is not something that people would say, oh, USA, like the West, those people, man, they just really steadfastly walk through things. It's like, no, nah, y'all are like a reading the wind, going from one place to another, whatever like is happening any moment, you react to it, not you, I'm not pointing at anyone, but you as a people, like our society is known for reactivity, not steadfastness. And so this right off the bat should challenge us. I believe we have what Pastor Adam Mabry out of Boston, our Every Nation Church there, calls a cultural form of attention deficit disorder. 
We have cultural ADD, living with the constant distraction of the urgent, which keeps us from seeing the daily need of the important. Like we're just, things are always urgent because we're all over the place and we just react to whatever has to be done in the moment until the steadfast, over a period of time, importance of things that just should be a consistent rhythm of our lives. And what is always important is prayer, to continue steadfast in prayer. When a pandemic comes along and now you're not supposed to leave your house and your work is shut down and there's all these things that you're not supposed to do, what doesn't change? The call to prayer. If you're home sick and you're quarantining or maybe you're just staying away from people because you got a seasonal flu or one of the 700 bugs that's going around this time of year, what doesn't change because of those circumstances? The call to prayer. It doesn't matter what we are experiencing. That is something that remains steadfastly important in our lives. And Paul starts us out that way. A Christian life should be one of constant prayer. Now, I'm not saying we all need to enroll in a membership at the monastery to kick off the new year and that we all just go and constantly pray and exclude ourselves from community. Like, maybe that could be a cool part of a sabbatical someday. Like, I want to go experience what it looks like to live an intentional, deep life of just prayer. Like, I'm not knocking that, but a constant life of prayer means that in all things and in all circumstances, our knee-jerk reaction to challenges and to excitement, to celebrating and to crisis is to pray, to communicate with God, to go to him. Not only when things are really bad, right? Like not you forget about praying because, well, I got it right now, God. I don't need you. Like I got things under control. Like listen to yourself if that's the posture you take towards prayer. But in all things, we should be prayerful. If Christ is really going to be at the core of our lives, then communion and communication with Christ through prayer have to be present. If we're going to say at the core of our lives is Jesus Christ, then prayer has to be a part of that. Because that's one of the ways that we get to communicate and be in communion, be in relationship with him. Prayer is that regular communion with God that we desperately need. And if our lives are going to be marked by gospel rhythm, prioritizing what is important over time, and that's important to be in relationship with God and others, then we have to begin with prayer. It starts off with that. Doug Moo, who's a theologian, said it this way. The point is that believers should pray habitually and with perseverance. We should always pray and not give up, and we should pray continually, and he references a couple other places in that in his book. But the point is, we should pray habitually and with perseverance. If you pray something on Tuesday and Wednesday, the prayer hasn't been answered yet, that doesn't mean move on to another prayer. It means keep praying. (laughs) Be steadfast. Don't be reactionary and disappointed because God's timeline is different than ours. We must develop the daily habit of joining God in prayer. But what does that look like? And Paul tells us that our prayers should be characterized by a few things. He says watchfulness, he says thank and thankfulness. And the word we've translated here as watchfulness has the basic sense of being awake and alert. It's not like you've heard that term of kind of being a watchdog. You just kind of eye everything around you like this, right? Like, hmm, interesting. That's not what he means with this watchful. It's not like skeptical, critical, and cynical. It's like alert and awake. What is God doing? What are the needs around me? What does Bree need prayer for? What does Aaron, Carol, what does Corey, McKenna, what do they need prayer for? What's going on in their lives is my brothers and sisters. How can I be alert and awake to the needs of my community, my city, my church, and the world around me? Watchful is about being alert and awake. Not cynical and skeptical. Back on a heel, just kind of looking out, you know, oh, it's, hmm, I don't know about you, I'm going to pray about that. Like, that's not the heart of what he's saying here. We are called to be alert and awake as we pray for and about and intercede on behalf of the city, church, relationships, and world around us. The Christian's prayer life is characterized by awareness of the needs of others, the needs of the church, and the city to know what requests to bring to God. 
If we are a renewed people who have received new life, right, who have the Spirit of God in us, there should be an alertness and there should be something about how we have new eyes to see the needs around us and that should inform our prayer lives. We get to pray with a listening heart, if you will, a heart that is sensitive to the world around us, not to the point where it just shrinks us back and isolates us in anxiety, but still with hope, anticipation, and faith that God is king over all, and he can fix and redeem all things. Prayer isn't just a talking to God. It's not a telephone call. It is communion with God. There is a relational depth and intimacy as we engage him that way. So we not only watch the world, but we watch him and what he's doing and how he's redeeming things. And we get the opportunity to join in, pray, and intercede also. Another way that we're to pray, he says, is thankfulness. Thankfulness. This keeps coming up since the beginning of this book. Thankfulness continues to resound out of Paul's, we'll say hand, because he wrote this. Philippians 4, 6, Paul writes it this way. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, if you think about that, isn't it fascinating that Paul connects making requests of God with thankfulness? He connects them with thankfulness. Our asking God for needs and blessings isn't ever to be done with anxiety, but gratitude. So when we come to God, it's not out of a, God, I don't know if you can do this. I just don't know if you're actually going to show up, but if you would, but it's, hey, God, I know you're good and you're going to work this out. And here's something that out of my alertness, I believe you want to do. And I want to come to you in prayer with that because you are good. And I've seen you show up and I'm so grateful that you are who you are and what you've done in my life. It's a spirit of gratitude. You see, anxious prayer says it this way. It says, I sure hope God hears this. But thankful prayer says, I'm so grateful God hears me. I'm so grateful he hears me. I'm so grateful. And one is laced with fear, and the other sounds like faith. Would we be a community that when we pray, when we go to God, out of a place of gratitude, it resounds of faith, not fear? <clears throat> Watchful, thankful prayers are prayers that let God know that we trust him, that we are listening, we are looking, we are trying to partner with him in his mission and what he's doing here in our world. Verse 3 gives us further instruction on prayer. See, Paul didn't only want the Colossians drawing near to God for their own sake, but for his as well. And this one may be harder for some of us in here. This should teach us a simple truth in this verse, that we should want others to pray for us. You see, in verse 3, Paul says, pray for us also. It's like, man, Paul, are you insecure? What's going on? No, he knows that prayer is important, and he wants covering. He wants people to be praying for him because he's in the thick of it, in chains, as he said, in prison, but still perpetuating the gospel because he's not going to let a little imprisonment get in the way of his calling. You say, pray for me also. This should teach us it's okay to invite others to pray for you. Like, hey, pray for me. I'm in, I'm in the thick of it right now. Like, I'm, I'm battling right now. Would you pray for me? We should deeply desire the prayers of others on our behalf. That is not selfish. That is communal. That is being in community with God and with others. It's not, oh, I'm showing my weakness by needing prayer. It's I'm showing my faith believing that God hears prayers. And I'm going to invite others to do that on my behalf. If Paul did it, like, I'm okay doing that. If he did that from prison, I'm okay asking for some prayer. And notice what Paul prayed for and what he did not pray for. This is important here. He is sitting in a Roman prison. And what does Paul want God to do most of all? Open a door for the gospel. He's sitting in prison. I know what my prayers would be. God, I miss my wife. I miss my kids. I'm sick of sleeping on this concrete and having these people just feed me whatever porridge or whatever they give me, this dirty water every day. God, will you open that door in Jesus' name and let me out of here, right? The Pentecostal in me would start to come out, and I'll be praying at that door. But the reality is Paul's like, no, I want an open door for the gospel, not for me to escape. 
He is prioritizing what is important on a grander scheme on what God is wanting to do. And he acknowledges, I'm here in chains and God's still using me. So if this is where he's going to use me from, if this is my hub, praise God that I can put pen to paper and the church continues to grow and people continue to be built up. He wants an open door for the gospel. Paul did not ask for the prison doors to be open, but the doors of ministry might be open. It was more important for Paul to be a faithful minister than a free man. Think about that. It was more important for Paul to be a faithful minister of the good news of Jesus than to be a free man in this season and circumstance of his life. It is worth noting that in all of Paul's prison prayers, his concern was not for personal safety or material help, but for spiritual character and blessing. That was continually his prayer as he wrote to the churches from prison, that his spiritual character would continue to grow and that it would be blessed and that the mission of God would go forth. How strange that Paul would want God to help him do the very thing that caused his arrest. Like, I'm in here because of what I'm doing, but I still want you to help me continue to do that. It just seems twisted in our Western way of thinking, doesn't it? He had no intention of giving up his ministry or of changing his message. The proclamation of the gospel, as we see evidenced by Paul, is empowered by prayer. The proclamation of the gospel is empowered by prayer. And the Spirit of God uses the word of God as we come to the throne of grace and ask God for his blessing. One theologian said it this way, We must never separate the word of God from prayer because God has joined them together. We can't separate the word of God from prayer because he has joined them together. You see, Paul gives us a clue here of how living a life of a gospel rhythm works. We draw near to God in scripture, prayer, and meditation, but our prayer isn't just for our sake. It's not for our sake alone. And while we love and enjoy God's presence, and we need that, and we need to be filled up so that we can overflow his presence and love, we find ourselves being filled filled up for the sake of others. That is what we engage in prayer in this lifestyle for. It's not just for ourselves and how big of a holding tank I can get for God's presence, but how can I be overflowing that wherever he would lead me? And then eventually our prayers are stirred for the sake of others that don't know Jesus, even those who might hate us for telling them the good news of the gospel. We saw that with Paul, like he was hated and imprisoned for telling others this good news. They wanted nothing to do with it, but he still considered it a worthy message and a worthy part of his calling, mission, and character to perpetuate that even to those who might hate him. And just as Paul was asking for prayer for God to open doors, our prayer should eventually compel us from our knees and out of our churches into a world that desperately needs the good news of the gospel. Our prayer doesn't allow us to just stay in some contemplative place of me and Jesus. Like God-centered, biblically-centered prayer will compel us into the world to share this news for the sake of others. For the sake of a world that desperately needs a gospel of grace. For the world that needs the gospel of grace. So we must pray for the ability to make the gospel clear, not muddy. He says, I pray that you'd help me, that we should communicate this in a clear way. That we would make it clear, not muddy. To say it like, or to say it like we should, clear and powerfully and compelling. To say it in a compelling way. One of the other days, uh, about a week and a half back, one of my daughters was saying something. She's like, does that make sense, Dad? And I said, yeah, clear as mud. (laughs) Or clear as a puddle of mud or something like that. She's like, huh? That doesn't make sense. That's not very clear. I said, exactly. Like, it's, it's not very clear. And so often, we explain things in a way that it makes perfect sense because we've been thinking about it for who knows how long. So in our head, we think we're communicating all of the intention and all of the context and all of the days or weeks of thought, but we communicate it so simply that we leave a bunch out, but we expect it all to, like, come across to people. Now, my wife would tell you I'm a master at that in the context of our communication in our marriage. I am very good at communicating parts of things and expecting her to read my mind to receive the rest of it. 11 years in, and she's doing great. It's all my fault, but we're, we're getting better. 
Um, but it, it's that concept of like, we think we know it, but we're not communicating in a way that is clear and not muddy. Like, it's just, it's kind of got residue in it that is clouding the ability to fully receive what it is you're trying to communicate. So in your heart, you're like, no, I, I communicated that. But it was really muddy. So how do we make sure that we're communicating the gospel clear? That we are bringing clean living water into the world, not muddy, cloudy water. So that people actually know what you're trying to communicate. That is the way we're called to communicate this gospel. And verse 5 and 6 make up the other side of this gospel rhythm, which is going out into the world with the gospel. Just as we are to draw near to God... We go out into the world bringing with us the truth and grace of Jesus. And once we have risen from our moment of communion with God, which is necessary and where these things start, we must receive the instructions God gives us in verse 5 to walk in wisdom towards outsiders, those who aren't yet part of a church family or faith community or the way of Jesus. But why would Paul put it this way? And we're going to get into into the preach part here. Uh, why would Paul instruct us to be wise regarding outsiders? Like, why is that so important to him? Now, I, ever since I first, like, learned who Jesus was and accepted him as my Lord and Savior, like, Paul's writing and his way of life have fascinated me. So I'm like, well, duh, I've, I read Paul's stuff so much. Like, this makes sense. This is who he is. But one Bible scholar puts it this way. Why would Paul instruct us to be wise regarding outsiders? This is out of a book called The Bible Guide. It's a very generic title, but good stuff. It says, Paul cares greatly about the impression that Christians make on outsiders. He warns the Colossians to be wise, not using their Christian freedom to be rebellious or lazy. God will give them many opportunities to share their faith, but they must be both loving and challenging in their conversations with everybody. That is, that is like kind of sums up how you are to engage in communicating with those that he calls outsiders. So he says, be wise in how you do it. What does wisdom look like in this case? And in verse 5 and 6, Paul qualifies what wisdom means, and he gives us a few characteristics. There's wisdom with time, there's wisdom with speech, and there's wisdom in the way we answer questions. There's three facets of wisdom, and we're going to dig into those today. Now, all of this wisdom has a purpose greater than just living a fulfilled life. So many times you hear titles of books or sermons or snippets on, you know, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, wherever you go for your daily, like, motivational minute. Um, that The idea is, like, live your best life, have a fulfilled life, be happy, and everything seems to be pointed towards you deserve and need to be happy and fulfilled with your circumstances and your feelings in any given moment. And that's just not the gospel. It's a bigger picture than that. It's not about a self-oriented goal, but it's about a mission that Jesus gave us. And we get the honor of being a part of that, even when it's uncomfortable. So the church at Colossae existed to spread the kingdom of God, not hoard the good news to themselves. And they were called to bring others to recognize the lordship of Christ. Not Jesus was a good guy and he had a good message. But because Jesus was a good guy and he lived a sinless life and he died the death that everybody deserved to die, paying the price for their sin so that when he rose three days later, proving he was who he said he was, the son of God, God in incarnate in a body as he did that, that meant good news for everybody. It meant good news for everybody, and it means that he now sits on the throne in our lives and in eternity. We don't get to be little G-gods of our own life telling Jesus how we're going to function in any given moment because it feels better or it makes more sense to us. And this is the message that they had been commissioned to share in this world. There is a lordship of Jesus. There is a headship. He is the king. He calls the shots and he is in charge. Maybe I was living this way before and I don't know how to give that up, but God tells me that's not the way I'm supposed to live. If I am going to put him on the throne in my life, that means those things go and the new self comes upon me. That was the goal of Paul's instructions here is how do you now do this? How do you interact with the world in a way that perpetuates this good news, shows it to them, through how you live. And he says it requires wisdom. Great. There's a million books on wisdom, and I bet only a few of them actually match up to gospel principles, right? So what does this look like 
for us. And the first is wisdom with time. How many of you have ever said, I'll do it tomorrow? That's a daily thing for me. I don't know, maybe at least a few times a day. Would it be fair to say that all of us have the capacity to procrastinate? <clears throat> now, what happens when that infiltrates our missional life? And it's not just about the tasks, chores, bills, and other various things that you have and your responsibility as an adult, as a contributor to society. What about when, say, I'll tell them about Jesus tomorrow. I'll think about that heavy topic tomorrow. I'll dig deeper into the scriptures tomorrow. And all of a sudden, your tomorrows become next week's, become as a New Year resolution, right? You see what I'm saying here? Like, the tomorrows build into months and quarters and years. Wisdom with our time. And Paul wants the Colossians and us to realize that our number of tomorrows is limited. Tomorrow is not an unlimited resource. You don't know when your last tomorrow is, but live your life like it may be tomorrow. <laughs> it's a lot of tomorrows. Therefore, we should be wise with our time in light of this. Again, the theolog <laughs> theologian, I can't speak today, Doug Moose says it this way. I think I got it up on the screen for you because it's like a paragraph. He says, Paul views the time in which believers find themselves as caught in the tension of the already and not yet. Believers live after the initial coming of Messiah and the inauguration of the redemptive kingdom. But they also live in expectation of a second coming of Messiah to complete the work of redemption. An important aspect of wise living is to use the short time God has given us to best effect. In Colossians, because of the force on outsider, or focus on outsiders, this will refer specifically to making the most of open doors that God gives us to evangelize. And by open doors, it's saying opportunities. Opportunities that God gives us to evangelize. Wisdom with time says we make the most of those. They should be a focus, a priority in our lives because we don't know if God put someone who lives in that house on my heart, I don't know how many tomorrows they have, but I know that God has the best news that they could ever hear, and so why would I wait? That's wisdom with time. <clears throat> he also says there should be wisdom with our speech. Disciples of Jesus must be wise with their words. Now, I'll be honest, this can look different depending on your upbringing, the region that you were brought up in, your professional training, what kind of hurts, traumas, and experiences you've had over your life. But regardless of all those things that may color the way we see the world, the reality remains that we are called to be wise with our speech. This impacts the words we choose and the content of our speech. We are told, let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt here in this. The fact that the word listens to the or that the world listens to the words we say and holds us up to them. So when we say things, and people, especially if they know what we believe, who we believe in, who we follow, the lifestyle we live, they're watching. Does this match up with that scripture they say that dictates their lives? Now, none of us can be perfect. But people that don't follow Jesus also know the Bible, and they're going to hold you to a standard of that. How many times do we hear, Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites? Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. That's always a fun one to have a conversation about. You know, I'm just not down with the church because Christians are hypocrites. And I was having this conversation, and I believe it was with Drea a while back, and it's like, oh, I understand what you're saying and the sentiment of that. But the reality is, Christians are people who are flawed and broken, but they're trying to live towards a better standard. That doesn't necessarily make them like hypocrites. It just means at least if we have a posture of humility, like the Bible calls us to, like, hey, I'm on a journey. I may not be perfect, but this is what I subscribe to, and I'm trying to do better at it. Think about it that way. When you subscribe to something, does that mean you fully do it perfect all the time? Like anybody ever subscribe to like Noom or MyFitnessPal or a gym or any of these things? And just because you have a subscription to it and you're trying to do better at it and you're trying to get on that track and allow that to guide your life, does that mean that every day, every decision, every meal aligns with all of that? Like, come on. 
So are now you a hypocrite because you have a subscription to that? You subscribe to trying to live that way of life, but you're not perfect at it all the time, right? Like, no. But that, the world looks at us that way, so at least do your best. And do it with humility. Do it from a humble place so that when you do mess up, you're like, I'm doing my best. I never told you I was going to do this perfect, but this is, this is what I'm aspiring for. This way of Jesus, like, I, I've committed my life to doing my best every day by his power to live after that example. And I'm going to mess up, and I'm going to let you down, I'm going to offend you, but you want to go on this journey with me. Right? Be, be really clear. Be humble. None of us is going to do it perfect. None of us is going to live this way where outsiders will look in and say, man, they're doing it perfect. Are, are they Jesus? Like, that's not the goal here, that we would literally try to be him, that we'd, we want to impersonate him. We want to model our lives after him so we can point others to him. So don't get caught up in that, well, I can't do it perfect, because how many times do you get that gym membership, and you're like, ah, I missed a week. I better just cancel it. No, you can restart. <laughs> You can, you can try again. We can just start day one over again with steadfastness and still chase after that way. Making sense? Be wise with our speech. We're not supposed to be perfect, but the one who we follow is, and he's a great example for this. Be gracious. Be humble. In his book, God's Not Dead, Dr. Rice Brooks, who's one of the founders of our Every Nation Family of Churches, uh, gives us a helpful way to think about what this kind of speech should look like. And because the spectrum is so vast on what, what is wise use of words or conversation look like, um, he has this and he lines it under an acronym called SALT. And so I'm just going to break this down for you, give you a little tool of what this could look like with your neighbor in your workplace, with your family. And the first one is an S, because SALT's spelled with an S first. And it means start a conversation. You don't get the opportunity to listen if you don't start a conversation, right? Like, we, like, at the very least, have courage, boldness, faith, whatever, like, <laughs> hyper-energetic word you want to put to it. Start a conversation. Care about somebody enough that you'll get over the potential of being rejected in any given moment because Jesus loves them, and I'm going to start a conversation with them. So we start that with, with somebody that may not know Jesus yet or that you may not even know. We don't avoid them. We don't fear them or pounce on them either, right? We just pursue them and ask them, start a conversation. And then the A is the ask a question. So S-A reminds us not to berate someone with gospel facts. We don't just come at them and start a conversation. By the way, did you know that what you're doing is sin? Like, that's, that's not wise. It's not a way that's going to actually cultivate any soil to hear a gospel of grace from a posture of a messenger that is humble. Ask a question. Jesus engaged in conversations with all kinds of people. So should we by asking questions. And then the third one, which is the hardest for most people, is listen. If you ask a question, listen to the answer. Don't ask a question so that you can say what you want to say. And interrupt them in the middle of it. Well, you know what? Well, I was thinking this about when you were saying that. And like, no, no, no. Just listen. Hey, how's it going? My name's Chris. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. Thanks for asking. Hey, no problem. Can I ask you, like, do you come to this park often? Is this kind of your, is this in your neighborhood? So you come here. I see you got your kids here. I got mine here. Like, do you come here often? And they start to talk about it. And you listen. You know, say, yeah, I love this park. Oh, my gosh. That, that one, my kids always, like, listen to what they're saying. Have humility and grace. And then when it's done, the T of this is when the opportunity arises in the conversation, we should tell the story of the gospel. And asking questions will help inform the context in which we get to share that in. So that may not mean you share the entire, like, now read the gospel of Mark. That's not what it's saying, okay? It's saying share the good news that you have in Jesus. And it can be in whatever context that they're talking about with you. Maybe yeah, we're coming here. Usually my husband comes with us, but he's in the hospital. He's sick or something like that. Like, man, and you, you share with him why in your paradigm of being a Jesus follower, you have hope in the midst of sickness and death and hardships and crisis. And you're sharing with them the gospel in a way that applies to their situation. You make it salty. It's seasoned, right? It's something that they are desiring. It's a good technique, but it never like works if you don't start a conversation. So that's always the hardest, the first step. So let's work on that S, and then we'll work on the A-L-T. Amen? Um, but we are called to be wise in how we talk 
how we share this gospel of grace, but it is not an optional thing. It's something we are called to do. I've heard it put this way. We look at 1 Corinthians and various other places in the Bible that tell us about spiritual gifts, right? And talking to lost people is not a spiritual gift that God maybe gives you or doesn't give you. It's called the family business. When you are adopted as a child of God, he has a family business, and that is bringing reconciliation and redemption into this world. And when you claim that adoption, when you say, yeah, I, I got that seal of the Holy Spirit. I've claimed an adoption like it talks about in Galatians. I'm, I'm fully into that, man. I want, I want the full inheritance of the kingdom of God. Well, that means you get the full responsibility of the family business as well. You can't sidestep that because of insecurity or feeling like you're unprepared or you don't have all the answers. The Spirit of God is in you. He will be with you and he will guide you. Third, wisdom with answers. If you start looking like, sounding like, and praying like Jesus, you're going to get questions. If you start looking like, maybe not physically, because you know I don't have any pictures of Jesus, but if your life starts looking like, sounding like, and praying like Jesus, you're going to get questions. When you do, because you will, you should be prepared to answer them. That doesn't mean that you have the right answer, the full answer, the perfect answer to all of them, but you should be prepared to be able to navigate a conversation about them from a place of what? Corey, from a place of humility, yes. From a place of humility. If you've been here long enough, you've heard me say this before in a sermon. Some of the most impactful discipleship moments I've ever had are when someone asks me a question and I say, man, I don't know. Can we figure that out together? And we go and we get into the word and we discover it together. Because I don't have all of the answers. Wisdom towards outsiders means that you've thought about some of the tougher questions of your faith. That you've thought about them so you can have meaningful conversations with others as they process through them. It doesn't mean you've mastered every apologetics book. For those of you that don't know what that word means, apologetics is just the ability basically to debate or answer all the questions about your faith. It doesn't mean you have to have a mastery over that. It just means like, yeah, as a Christian, I've been responsible in thinking through some tough things that like I've had, some tough questions I have, and I'm willing to conversate with others and talk through those things with them. <clears throat> think enough about your own faith that you can help someone else think through theirs, process through theirs, have those conversations themselves. So this gospel is a rhythm that we are supposed to live out in prayer and thankfulness and wisdom and on mission, loving Jesus and others, following him and fishing for men, being disciples that make disciples. The goal is not that we reach some finish line. The goal is that we multiply ourselves as disciples of Jesus, that we help someone else learn the way of Jesus and help them help someone else learn the way of Jesus. Multiplication is the goal. And a few ways to summarize that we are to do that is through persevering prayer and wisdom in our lifestyle and our speech with non-Christians, the way we interact with the world. Jesus Christ, worship team, you can come back up, should be central in the daily habits of his people. He should be at the core of the daily habits of the Christ follower. It's through Jesus that we can pray to God. It's because of Jesus that we are heard. It's for Jesus that we get up and tell others. It's joy in Jesus that we're inviting others into. It's wisdom from Jesus that we need if we're going to make disciples. And it's the glory of Jesus that we are living for. It's all about Jesus. He is at the center. So my question as we close is this. <clears throat> What if Jesus for you right now is not at the center, at the core, at the, the focus of your life? Because if he is, then you're probably like, okay, this is good. I got a few tools to walk this out in. Great. I, this is helpful. But if he's not, this could be kind of discouraging. You just sat through 40 minutes telling you how to live if Jesus is at the center, but you, he's not at the center of your life yet. What if he's not at the center right now? Maybe he has been before, but right now you're just trying to survive. You're just trying to get by. You just want to make sure you wake up tomorrow. What if that's where you're at? I believe that a message like this should be completed with an opportunity to respond, to say, Jesus, I want you to be at the center. Like, 
I don't want to live in ambiguity, wondering if I've done whatever right in any given day. That's, that's not the gospel. We make a choice. We commit our lives to Jesus. We receive him. He lives in us, gives us a new heart. He changes our heart to be more like his. He gives us different eyes to see the world, a redemptive lens for people that might annoy us or challenge us or circumstances and situations that are difficult. He says, yeah, but here's how I can work in this instead of run from that. He gives us a new perspective on our lives. And it would be my heart that there wouldn't be anybody that leaves today without being able to walk out and say, yeah, Jesus is at the center. He's at the core of my life. I've given my life to him. And now I need his power and his people to come alongside me as I live this life following him. So I want to give you the opportunity to take a step to do that today, to make him the center of your life, to give your life to him, to let him sit on the throne of your life. And what we're going to do, we're going to do this in a posture of just prayer and humility. And I believe out of this posture of prayer and humility, we'll end up resounding in thankfulness as we respond. But I'm just going to ask you all, bow your heads. Just bow your heads. Still your hearts before the Lord. Consider if for you individually, Jesus is at the center right now. And this isn't some manipulative moment where I'm trying to convince you all that Jesus is not at the center so we can get more hands raised. This is simply me saying, hey, as a responsible follower of Jesus or human being receiving this word, we need to take a realistic assessment if we're sick or not. Are you currently far from Jesus? Are you currently maybe stiff arming him because you don't know if he's safe? Or are you all in and you're doing your best out of a place of humility and grace and responsiveness every day to pursue him, to keep him at the center? And if you're not in the place of that last one where you're sold out, then I believe there's an opportunity for you to take a step forward. If Jesus is not currently at the center of your life, but you're ready to put him in that place, to make him the core, the center, the king of your life. With every head bowed, remaining bowed, I just want you to raise your hand. Just as a sign of receiving this good news for you. Not this, just that this is good news for other people in this room or other people in this world, but God, I receive that this is good news for me and I want you to be the king of my life. I want you at the center of everything. As imperfect as I may be, and may not be able to follow through in every given moment, I want you at the core of my life. If that's you, don't be shy. Just raise your hand. No one's watching, and we're going to pray together. And if this morning, maybe you're feeling that stirring, but just raising your hand, even though you know every head's bowed, it just still makes you a little nervous. You can still pray this prayer along with me. Go ahead, repeat after me this morning. Say, God, I'm sorry for the ways that I've lived that have separated me from you. God, will you forgive me? I put my trust in you. Will you live in me? Will you give me a new heart? Will you empower me to live the life you've called me to live? Thank you for saving me, for loving me, and for giving your life for me. Today, I commit my life to you. Amen. So God, we thank you for the hands that were raised. We thank you for the work you're doing in our hearts, in our lives. And God, I pray that as we leave this place, it wouldn't be just about us, but you working in our lives and being at the center would just be the start for something amazing you're doing on this campus, in this city, in our families, and in this world. God, would your kingdom expand in our midst. And would you use us to be a part of that? We thank you for the honor and privilege it is to be a part of your family business. And we pray, God, that you would be the heroes of our stories, the heroes, uh, the hero of our church, and the hero of this city. So we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand as we close in worship.